Hello, this is uh, Steve Roman, and this is my third lecture on elementary category theory. I just want to make a couple of comments before I start. I want to finish chapter one of my book, which I didn't get a chance to do in the last lecture because it ran rather long. And speaking of my book, I have decided to make it available for purchase in PDF format on my website. So if you're interested, you can go to my website. It's www.sroman.com and you'll find information about the Category Theory book. The book does contain uh, a number of topics that I'm not going to cover in the lectures and it will have some proofs that I won't do and it also has exercises. So there is some value to the book beyond what I'm doing in these in these lectures. I also uh, wanted to uh, thank you for leaving comments and for subscribing to my channel. I appreciate that and I want to encourage you to continue to leave comments. Uh, if you haven't left a comment yet I would sure like to hear from you. I even if you have left a comment, um, you know one of the differences between giving these lectures in video format and doing so in a classroom is that when I walk into a classroom I see who's there I know who's watching who's listening but over the uh, internet I can't tell whether I'm just talking to myself or not so if you have a minute and you're still watching if you could just leave a comment all you have to say is I'm still watching. You know that would be of some help to me. Uh, sorry for the hassle, but you know I, it, it, these lectures are a certain amount of work, and I would like to know that at least some people are still watching. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I left off last time. I had talked about some special types of morphisms in a category, left and right invertible morphisms and left and right cancelable morphisms. The next topic I wanted to talk about is very important initial and terminal objects in a category. An initial object let's say A in C is initial it's a very simple concept. If for all objects B in the category there exists exactly one morphism from A to B. So here's A. There's exactly one morphism to all the other objects in the category and to itself. The HOM sets leaving A, HOM A to anything else, has size 1. That's a more succinct way of saying it, I suppose. Okay, so those objects are called initial objects. Terminal objects are the dual concept and I'm going to talk about duality uh, in a little while. So A in C is terminal if the HOM sets HOM XA have size 1 for all X in the category. So that means there is exactly one morphism entering A from any other object. It's possible for an object <clears throat> in a category to be both initial and terminal. That means that from any other object, there's exactly one morphism in each direction. 
Objects that are both initial and terminal are called zero objects. Okay. So for example, in the category set, what would be an initial object? That would be a set S for which there was exactly one set function going to every other set. Okay. Now how could that be if S had an element in it then and T had more than one element in it, then S could be sent to any of those elements. You'd have different functions going from S to T. So as soon as S has at least one element, it cannot be initial. But the empty set does have exactly one function leaving it going to any other function, and that is the empty function. So the empty set is in fact an initial object in the category set. It's the only initial object. It is possible for there to be more than one initial object or more than one terminal object in a category. What about terminal objects? So now we're looking at a set S where from any other set there is precisely one set function. Any singleton set will have that property because F will, if this is a function F here, it will have to map every element in T to the only element in S. So singleton sets, singleton sets are terminal. Okay. So in set there's one initial object that's the empty set, and there are a bunch of terminal objects. Every singleton set is a terminal object. What about in group? What would be a, an initial object in group? The empty set is not a group, the singleton, the trivial group with just the identity, identity always has to go to identity for a group homomorphism, and so there is in fact exactly one group homomorphism from the trivial group to any other group. It simply takes the identity in the domain to the identity in the codomain. Okay. So the trivial group is initial. but it's also terminal. There is precisely one morphism going from any group H into the trivial group because every element of H will have to go to the identity and that is a legitimate group homomorphism. So that makes the trivial group a zero object. And it's the only one. Related to the concepts of initial, terminal, and zero objects is something called a zero morphism. And to explain this so somewhat strange concept Let's take a look at some categories. For example, uh, in group, <clears throat> there is a morphism between any two groups, I'll call it Z, that sends every element to the identity. For lack of a better word, I guess you might call this the zero morphism. 
certainly would make sense for an abelian group because then this would be the zero element. Uh, for a multiplicative group, you can't, you'd like to call this the identity morphism, but you can't because that already has, uh, me has a meaning. So the zero morphism is, is the best we can do. For vector space, the zero morphism takes between two vector spaces takes every vector to zero, the zero vector. However, what I have just defined for you here is not a categorical concept because I'm using elements in the definition. How could you, let's take the case of vector spaces, how could you rephrase this definition in an equivalent way that did not involve elements, the zero vector or any other vector? Well, you can do it this way. You can think of Z as a composition of two maps, Z1, which takes V to the trivial vector space, and then Z2, which takes the trivial vector space to W. This is a morphism that I can define without mentioning elements, without mentioning vectors. It simply is the only morphism taking a vector space to the trivial vector space. And this one also, Z2, is purely categorical. I don't have to mention elements. The combination, I'm sorry, the composition takes V to W, and under our breath, hopefully with no one listening, we can say that this composition maps a vector, all vectors to zero, to the zero vector in W. Okay, this is, this we're not allowed to say when we're talking strictly categorically, but it, that's what happens. So, the way to express this zero morphism categorically is that it is a morphism, it is the morphism that can be factored through the trivial vector space. And the trivial vector space is the zero object. in the category of vector spaces. So now we have a categorical definition. A zero morphism in a category C with a zero object, call it Z, is any morphism that can be factored through Z. If I had just given you that definition initially, you would have scratched your head like I did the first time I saw it. That, that's pretty weird, but this is the motivation behind it. If you have a category C with the zero object Z, then um, there is exactly one zero morphism between any two objects. Because, well, actually, maybe I will let you do that. Okay. 
Also, zero morphisms absorb other morphisms. So if Z is a zero morphism from A to B, then the composition in either direction with any other morphism is a zero morphism. And I'll let you uh, think about that as well. Okay. I want to move on now to a really important concept that can be a bit confusing at first, and that is duality. We'll begin, if C is a category, by defining something called the dual category, or the opposite category and it's sometimes denoted C with a little OP superscript. The objects of the dual category are the same as the objects of the original category. The morphisms, the HOM set from A to B in the dual category is the HOM set in the original category from B to A. Okay. So composition is the first thing we need to address. How would you compose two morphisms? Uh, let's say that this goes from A to B and this goes from B to C and now we are talking in C op. Well, where did this F come from? It's actually a morphism from B to A in C. And G is a morphism from C to B in the original category C. The only way these can be composed is to first take G and then take F. That makes sense as a map from C to A in the original category and so I guess we better define this composite to be this. Okay, So G B C circle F A B the notation uh, kind of fails us a little bit here so I'll just write in C op is equal to this in C. And that kind of says it all right there. Composition works in the opposite order. Okay. So you could say that to compose two morphisms in C op, you just compose them in the opposite order in C and you're done. I guess it's pretty clear that if you take C op and then you take its dual, you will get back to C. And what that tells you is that every category is a dual category to something else, to its dual, in fact. Okay. So all categories are dual categories. The duality principle. Suppose that P is a property of categories. So it's a property that a category may or may not possess. If you'd like to, you can think of it, this is the class of all categories, as a subclass. Some categories have P, some do not have P. What is the dual property? P op, that's a, another property of categories, is a dual property to P if for all categories C, C 
C has P op if and only if C op has P. And since this is symmetric, we can simply say that two properties, P and Q, are dual or not dual. We don't have to say P is dual to Q and Q is dual to P. Okay. For example, um, the initial objects in C op are the terminal objects in C. So the property of having an initial object and having a terminal object are dual properties. The property of being isomorphic is a self-dual property. The dual of being isomorphic is being isomorphic because if A and B are isomorphic in C, then they're isomorphic in, in the dual category as well. So we have dual the dual of a category. We have the dual of a property. There is also something called the dual of a statement. So let's suppose that uh, S is a statement about categories. For example, uh, C has an initial object. The dual of S is the same statement stated for the dual category but expressed in terms of the original category. So it's kind of like a two-step process, that's a C. So what is this statement expressed for the dual category? It's C op has an initial object. And how do I express that in terms of C? C has a terminal object. Okay. I think my handwriting's deteriorating a little more, but I apologize for that. I'll do the best I can here. So that's how you form the dual of a statement. You express the statement in terms of the dual category. This we're talking about statements about categories, so somewhere in the statement it's got to mention categories. You write the statement down and you replace every mention of a category C by its dual category, and then you try to figure out how you would say that in terms of the original categories. That, that's the hard step. Okay, that, uh, you have to sort that out, and in this case it's fairly obvious, but you know it may be rather difficult to figure out the dual of some statements. It's not always going to be an easy task. Also, statements and their duals are not, in general, logically equivalent. Okay? There are, in fact, categories that have initial objects that do not have terminal objects, for instance. But in a, in a special case, uh, we can say a lot more. So let's suppose that, let's start a new page here. Suppose that pi is a collection of properties. Four categories. And we take the dual properties, oh, pi op, 
is the dual. And let's let uh, P be a single property. Okay. Consider a statement like if C has pi, then C has P. We could abbreviate this pi implies P. Since all categories are dual categories, we could write this this way. Well, if C has pi up, then C up has pi. That's how we define dual properties. And so if 2 holds, then C up has P, and therefore C has the dual property. So if 2 holds, 3 holds, and by the symmetry that's going on here, 2 and 3 are equivalent. So 1, 2, and 3 are all equivalent. And so in simpler terms, pi implies p, if and only if pi op implies p op. I don't know, maybe this all seems a little bit like smoke and mirrors, but uh, we're not quite done yet. This is called the duality principle. For categories. If pi is self-dual, so that means that pi and pi op are the same set of properties, then we get something that looks like pi, oh sorry, capital pi implies p if and only if capital pi implies p op. And the empty set of properties is self-dual. So empty set implies P if and only if empty set implies P op. What does this mean? It means if the empty set of properties is satisfied by a category, then then P is then uh, P is satisfied. Well. This is a statement about all categories. So if P, I'm sorry, P, um, I, okay, I'll say it this way. If P holds in all categories, let me leave off the if. P holds in all categories if and only if P op holds in all categories. And that is a simplified version of the principle of duality that is the most common. Whenever you have a theorem that says the following holds in all categories, the principle of duality tells you you have a second theorem that does not require additional proof that the dual properties also hold in all categories. So, for example, one can prove, as I believe we did, that all initial objects are isomorphic. In other words, in all categories, all initial objects are isomorphic. Therefore, in all categories, all terminal objects are isomorphic. That particular example didn't save us much work, but there are many more, much 
uh, more complicated theorems whose duals you do not need to prove because of the principle of duality. Now I want to talk about um, defining new categories from old categories or let's say from existing categories. This is a common theme in mathematics. For example, when you first study groups or vector spaces or whatever, some algebraic structure, one of the things you do is try to get new structures from old ones. So, for instance, if you have a vector space, you can take subspaces and get new vector spaces that way. You can take Cartesian external direct products and get new vector spaces that way. Uh, you can take quotient spaces and get new vector spaces that way. You can do similar things in the world of category theory. Up to now, our examples of categories have come directly from structures that we have studied before, like groups and rings and vector spaces and, and partially ordered sets and so on. But now the idea is, if we have an arbitrary category or categories, how can we create new categories? One rather direct way is the product of categories. So if we have C and D categories, we can take their product. The objects are just the ordered pairs, A, B, A is an object in C, B is an object in D. Morphisms are ordered pairs of morphisms, one from C and one from D, and uh, I'm going to let you fill in the details on this one. It's pretty straightforward. Another way we can get new categories from old is the following. If C is a category, then we can define the category C arrow of arrows uh, the arrow category. And the objects are arrows or morphisms, which I'll write this way, from C. When you're defining a category, defining the objects is generally pretty easy because any class is potentially the class of objects of a category. The trick is to define the morphisms and to make sure that composition is associative and that they're identity morphisms. So, if we take a second arrow in C, how do we define a morphism from this arrow to this arrow? Well, we define it as a pair of morphisms, alpha, beta, alpha going from A to C, beta going from B to D. So alpha goes from uh, between the domains of F and of the arrows and beta goes between the codomains and then we need this to commute so traveling this way gives us the same result as traveling that way so beta circle F is going to have to be G circle alpha and that's how we define the morphisms in the arrow category and I'm going to leave it to you to check that uh, composition is associative and that there are identity morphisms. So that's the category of arrows. The next one is extremely important, comma categories.
we can do this uh, at three different levels of abstraction. So we'll start at the bottom, and those would be arrows leaving an object. A, let's say, in a category. So an object of this comma category would look something like this, an arrow leaving A. Another object, G, another arrow leaving A. So the objects are the arrows leaving A. I'm going to amend that slightly in a minute, but that's close enough for right now. How do we define the morphisms between two objects, such as these two objects? They are defined to be morphisms between the codomains, B and C, such that the triangle commutes. So that's the definition of a morphism between two objects. If we have another object D here with another morphism, so that's another arrow, in our, that's another object in our uh, comma category, then, and we have a morphism beta, let's say, that goes from C to D, then the composition of these two morphisms now, there's, there's two senses in which you we're using the word composition here. Alpha and beta are morphisms in C, and so we can take the comp composition. But what I'm trying to do is define the composition of the morphism that goes from this object to this object, followed by the morphism that goes from this object to this object. So... In a sense here, alpha is playing two roles. It's a morphism in, C from, uh, in the category C from B to C, but it's also a morphism in the comma category. Okay. So to write this looks kind of silly, but what I'm saying is that in the comma category, the composition of the morphism alpha and beta is the same as the composition of alpha and beta thought of simply as morphisms in C. Okay. So I hope that I hope that was clear. Maybe it would help if we had a slightly different notation if alpha bar was the morphism that mapped this object to this object. Uh, a, C, G, and similarly for beta bar, it maps the, the object to this object, A, H, D. Then we can say that this composition is just equal to the composition of the two morphisms in C, okay, which now maps the first object in the comma category to the third object in the comma category. So if, and maybe that'll help. I said I was going to amend this a little bit, um, and that is that for generalization purposes, the objects of this comma category are ordered pairs that look like this. These are really the objects. Strictly speaking, if we're given the arrow, the, the map, then we are given the codomain. So we don't really need this first coordinate here for identification purposes. But this is how objects in the comma category are traditionally defined, and so we need to stick with that. It helps me to make another definition, which is probably not standard, and then as I refer to A as the anchor, A-N-C-H-O-R, anchor object. 
Okay, so this comma category is the category of all arrows leaving the anchor object. Uh, more precisely, all ordered pairs of this form. There is another term for this category, and it, it's called the co-slice category. Co-slice category. The dual to this category is the slice category, which is just the arrows entering an object, which I'll call the anchor object again. So at this time we have arrows coming in and uh, I'll let you define the morphisms and check the associativity yourself. I don't think, I think these are both called comma categories, simple comma categories, even though one's a slice category and the other's a co-slice category. Frankly, all these terms, I think, are just confusing. Uh, I like to say arrows entering an object and arrows leaving an object. Uh, that's quite descriptive and helps me remember what's going on. Okay, so we can generalize this as follows. We have two categories now, C and D, and we have a functor from C to D. Then we take an object here, let me call it B. Our anchor is going to be over here. This is our anchor object. And our morphisms or arrows are going to go this way. So an object here technically is the an ordered pair, object B, and morphism from the anchor to the image of B under the functor. So these are the objects. And how do you define a morphism? A morphism is a map in C let's say to be prime. So over here now we have our anchor and we have FB F and we have FB prime say F prime then a morphism in this comma category is a morphism in C from B to B prime such that when we fill this in here we get a triangle that commutes. So F alpha circle F equals F prime. Okay. And so again we have to check associativity by creating another uh, object over here and another morphism and I'll let you take care of that too. It's good practice. There is one more level of generalization that I will do quickly because it's not something we're actually going to use. I don't think I have any occasion to use this in the rest of the lectures, but it goes like this. Now we have two objects, one here and one here, and we have morphism over here. So, oh, and then uh, we need two functors. I'm sorry, this is a G because we need two functors. Okay, so it looks like that. That's GC. 
So I'll let you fill in the details on this one. As I say, I don't believe I'm going to use that uh, in future lectures. So there's sort of three levels of abstraction for comma categories. The first of which is the one that we will see most often. Uh, I think we'll have occasion to see the second one, but not the third one. Okay, now, uh, the most important example of creating new categories from old categories are the HOM set categories. So we begin with the category C. And an anchor object. And instead of taking individual morphisms to other objects, we take the entire set, the entire HOM set, AB, as an object. So the objects of this category are sets. This is, in fact, a subcategory of set because the objects are sets and the morphisms, as we will see, are set maps. If I have another HOM set, AC, then what I need to define are the, is, are the morphisms between these two HOM sets. Okay. As I said before, defining the objects of a category is not the hard part. It's defining the morphisms and making sure that everything is okay as far as the definition of category is concerned. But how to, so to define the morphisms from HOM AB to HOM AC, just ask yourself, how would you, so it's got to be a set function, how would you take an element here in this HOM set and produce an element here? Okay. How would you turn an, a, a function from A to B or a morphism from A to B into a morphism from A to C. Well, you would you would follow. So I'll take a map here, a morphism from B to C, and let's say I've got an F here, and I take the composition. So first I follow F, then I follow alpha, and the result will be a morphism from A to C. So uh, this is a f this is this morphism alpha is really a function from HOM AB to HOM AC, and alpha of F is just simply F circle alpha, and there is a widespread notation for this, and that is alpha with a superscripted arrow going this direction. In words, I would just say follow by alpha. It's the follow by alpha morphism. Okay. And then you need to check that composition is associative and there's an identity and so on, which I will leave for you to do. Okay. That's the HOM set category. There is the dual of this where we look instead at HOM sets going in the other direction, HOM BA, this is B here, and then we'd have another one here, HOM CA. And so it would be good for you to take a moment and figure out what the morphisms should look like. Do they go this way or do they go this way? And do we follow by the morphism alpha or do we proceed by alpha? 
So since this is a dual situation, you can probably sort that out without too much thinking, but you should spend a little bit of time just to sort that out. Homset categories are very important categories, and we will encounter them often. Actually, every category is a Homset category. If we take a category C, all we have to do is adjoin a new, a new object to C, one that doesn't exist already. I'll call it star. And then for every object in the category, adjoin a new morphism, FA, FB. A single morphism, we need an identity morphism here, of course. A single morphism from star to A, so star becomes an initial object. And then the um, object A can be identified with this morphism, or in fact, with the HOM set, HOM star A because that just consists of the single morphism FA and we can just sort of make the identification with A itself. So objects are identified with HOM sets and we have a HOM set category. Okay. So that ends the first chapter of my book and uh, so I'm going to stop this lecture here. Again, please leave comments and thank you very much for watching.